Hello everyone, my name is Hugo and today I'm going to talk to you about optimizing your JavaScript bundle size, why it's important, why should you use it and how to do it. But before I do that, please remember to like and subscribe to stay up to date with all the tech news and tech tips that we have. So one of the first things when we talk about bundle size is actually identifying whether bundle size is something that you have a problem with. Um, nowadays, it's pretty easy to be checked. It's pretty easy to check. Uh, there are numerous tools to do that. Uh, doesn't matter wh what build system you're using, whether it's Webpack, uh, Parcel, uh, Vite, every, pretty much everything has a bundle checker. The way bundle checkers work is you tell your build system that whenever your next build is happening, you want your build system to analyze everything that's happening during the build and produce a map of how your bundle looks like. So whether it's split into multiple bundles, whether it's one big bundle, uh, whether every component that you're using that you're lazy loading is actually a separate bundle. You can see all of those things by just plugging in and running a bundle checker. The next step after you identify that you either have a big bundle size issue or you might be able to improve upon bundle size, which is most of the time possible, it's it's really rare that you see a bundle that's optimized to the limit and most of the time you can actually make your site or or app much smaller and more performant um, the next step is seeing what takes up the most of your bundle so a common problem that i encounter is that people are serving one or two gigantic javascript chunks and it turns out that in one of those chunks we have a piece of logic or a library that's not really being used all that much or is being used in one specific place in the web app that's used by 1% of the user or is used 1% um, of the time. So a scenario where we are actually loading all the JavaScript that's not being used right away or that's not crucial for the user when they first visit the page is suboptimal. The best way of handling those kind of scenarios is actually utilizing something called lazy loading. So a good example of this would be if we have a very complex component, let's say, um, let's say a map that's interactive and allows you to do all sorts of things, but that map is only really available in one place of the app and the app has multiple routes. It's not a good idea to load all that map code the first time user actually opens up the app because they're not gonna they're not gonna see the app they're, they're not gonna see the map they're not gonna interact with it yet there's no reason uh, for us to defer loading of the first page just for the map now lazy loading of the map would be telling react that this is a component that we only really want to import and load once we actually get to use it in this scenario we would tell react to lazily load this component whenever we enter the page that actually utilizes the map. So whenever a user goes to the page that utilizes the map, we would load just this piece of JavaScript responsible for the map and show it to the user. In that way, until the user actually sees the map in the application, they would never even have to deal with all the JavaScript required for the map. Now I'm talking about lazy loading certain components and that is a very good idea most of the time whenever we have uh, a situation similar to what i described so one component that requires a lot of javascript and that is not used all the time by everyone however a gen generally a good strategy whenever you have multiple views whenever you have uh, very long pages uh, very long views is actually plainly code splitting being only serving the JavaScript that your user actually currently needs. So whenever I enter the web app and I see the dashboard page, I don't really want to load all the JavaScript that's needed for 
the other pages because why would I? I just want to see the dashboard page for now. Now, if I go to the other page, I can load the JavaScript for this page. And basically this kind of strategy is called code splitting. It's really easy to do nowadays, uh, especially with Next.js because Next.js pretty much with the, with the page architecture does all of this by default. So you don't really have to interface with it or do any special configuration. Whenever you split your app into pages, every page will have its own JavaScript and that will be taken care for you. So whenever we talk about bundle size, we should also consider uh, a couple of rendering strategies that we can take. So we have client-side rendering, server-side rendering, and static-side rendering. Now, whenever we talk about static-side rendering and server-side rendering, uh, they really are uh, both kinds of server-side rendering. Now, what server-side rendering is, um, is as opposed to client-side rendering, instead of just taking all the JavaScript needed for a specific page, then using that JavaScript to actually build our React page. Uh, what we do with server-side rendering is that we're doing all of this on the server. So on the server, we're seeing that, okay, this piece of JavaScript is supposed to build an HTML document that, is, that will look like this. Um, and then we serve that HTML document already uh, with depending on how you go about it uh, with the critical styles and with all the styles. Uh, the point of it being that we don't really wait for the JavaScript to parse. We don't really wait for the JavaScript to uh, initialize React and, and build our page. We serve that page as a sort of snapshot of itself that user immediately sees. React server components are actually a super interesting topic when it comes to hydration, server-side rendering, client-side rendering. Uh, as it completely changes the, the way we think about components and how they're rendered. Um, it's definitely a topic deserving of a video in itself. So we're not gonna, I'm not gonna talk about it too much right now, but it's definitely something that um, you should read about and check out when, whenever you're thinking about rendering strategies in your app. Whenever we talk about bundle size, it's also pretty good to mention tree shaking. Whenever you're using external libraries um, and whenever you're viewing your own components, it's good to think about tree shaking. Uh, as a good example of tree shaking would be whenever you're, you want to use Lodash in your app or any other library that's pretty massive and um, offers a lot of utility out of the box. You probably don't want to use every single function and every single piece of that library in your app. Um, but maybe one, maybe two, um, maybe more functions. Point of it being that you only want the very specific parts of that library and not a byte of JavaScript more. Now, tree shaking comes to the rescue here as most of the modern libraries are tree shakeable pretty much out of the box by, mo by most build systems. Meaning that if I only use one or two functions from Lodash, I'm not actually going to load the entirety of Lodash. Um, I'll actually only load those two functions and the rest of Lodash will be tree shaken. So it will be gone from my dependency tree, which is where the term tree shaking comes from. As always, thank you for watching. Uh, I hope you learned something today and please remember to like, subscribe, comment, uh, ask us any questions, anything you might have on JavaScript bundle size and see you again in the next video.